The passive voice causes a lot of heartache for readers and writers alike. You have probably been told to avoid the passive voice. And that's not bad advice, except for the fact that sometimes passive voice is exactly what you need. In this short video, I'm going to try to accomplish three things. One, I want to give you a working definition of the passive voice uh, that you will find easy to use. Uh, secondly, I want to talk about the perils of the passive voice. And third, I want to talk about the situations in which the passive voice is perfectly appropriate. The best way to get your head around the passive voice is to understand it in contrast to the active voice. A sentence typically describes an action, and that action has an actor. When, the, when that actor is the grammatical subject of a sentence, we call that sentence an active sentence. That sentence is in the active voice. So consider this sentence. Ken gave Barbie flowers. This sentence is in the active voice because Ken is the grammatical subject, and Ken is also the actor. There was an action, the giving of flowers, and Ken is the actor. He's the one who did it. But English grammar is very flexible. It doesn't require that the actor be the grammatical subject of a sentence. If you want the recipient of an action to be the grammatical subject, English grammar lets you do that, and that's what we call the passive voice. Barbie was given flowers by Ken. Barbie is the grammatical subject in that sentence, but she's not the actor. I can even make the inanimate flowers the subject of that sentence. The flowers were given to Barbie by Ken. Avoid passive voice is a helpful rule of thumb, but it's only a rule of thumb. The deeper rule is make active voice your default, and the corollary is only use passive voice when you have a good reason to. The language portion of our brains are wired so that we expect the actor of an action to be the grammatical subject of a sentence. And when that's the case, we feel like things are moving right along. We feel like we're being guided by the grammar to that most important, that most important narrative question, who did what? Now, a reader is fully capable of flipping a passive sentence back around to the active and figuring out who did what. But if you're going to make a reader go through that extra work, that reader is going to want to know why, if only at a subconscious level. In passive constructions, the sense of agency gets fuzzy. Let's return to the Ken and Barbie sentence. Barbie was given flowers by Ken. Who's the actor here? It's still Ken. Ken drove to the florist shop. He picked out the flowers. He plunked down his hard-earned money. He carried the flowers all the way back to Barbie's house. But where is Ken in the sentence? He's tucked away in a prepositional phrase at the very end of the sentence. It's just not fair. Or consider this version. Barbie was given flowers. Ken, the guy who went to all the trouble, has disappeared completely. Do you see why I find passive voice so aggravating? And then there's the simple fact that a passive construction uses more words than an active construction. Ken gave Barbie flowers is four words. Barbie was given flowers by Ken is six words. So that's 50% more verbiage for 0% more meaning. Every problematic construction in the English language exists because there are situations in which that construction is exactly what you need. When you're expressing passivity, for example, the passive voice is perfect. So in this sentence, Andrew was bullied as a child. To be a victim of bullying is to be in a position of passivity. And in this case, it doesn't matter who the bullies, who the actors were, even if the writer happens to know their names. The passive voice is also a great choice when you don't know who the actor is. My bike was stolen yesterday is in passive voice. And it ought to be in passive voice because I don't know who stole my bike. If I did, I'd be reporting them to the police instead of writing sentences about them. And finally, the passive voice can be an effective way to direct your reader's attention. 
the subject of a sentence enjoys a place of privilege in that sentence. Your reader knows to pay special attention to whatever, whatever noun appears in that slot. The passive voice allows you to move some noun besides the actor into that slot, and so push that noun into a place of prominence. Handled well, the passive voice can give some nuance to your writing. Look at these two sentences. An unusually large piano player ejected Clarence from the saloon. Clarence was ejected from the saloon by an unusually large piano player. There's not a big difference between those two sentences, but you can feel a difference, can't you? In the one, the emphasis, the emphasis is on Clarence, and on the other, the emphasis is on the piano player. Just a small difference, just a nuance. But the difference between good writing and really good writing is often nuance. When you use the passive voice, remember that you're asking something of your reader. You're asking him to take an extra step of decoding. Do you have a good reason for asking your reader to go to that little extra bit of effort? If so, then by all means, use the passive voice. But if you don't, stick with the active voice.